And on PM Express tonight, a conversation that started just after the December 7 polls, dissolution of the 7th Parliament and how the 8th Parliament will be looking like. Interestingly, a lot has been happening today and that is uh, telling us who gets to go or join the 8th Parliament and who does not get to join the 8th Parliament. So that's the North Injunction and the inauguration of the 8th Parliament. Let's see. The Cape Coast High Court in the last few hours has granted an injunction suit against the MP-elect for the Asin North constituency, James Jechi Kwesin. And the court has ruled that he does not hold or he cannot hold himself as the MP-elect for the constituency. Let's see. Uh, it follows a petition filed by one Michael Ankuma that the MP elect so holds himself uh, onto his Canadian citizenship when he was filing to the contest in the December polls, which contravenes the provision of Article 94, uh, Clause 2A of the 1992 Constitution of Ghana. And uh, he's urging the court to declare his position as MP elect null and void. Now, dissolution of the seventh parliament, this will be very interesting. And this order by the Cape Coast uh, Court will determine a lot in parliament tonight. The seventh parliament that is going to be dissolved at midnight and the eighth parliament that comes in at 12.01 a.m. It will be interesting. So how has the seventh parliament performed? The lead to the dissolution actually has been very phenomenal. The NPP is seeking to retain Professor Michael Quay as speaker, while the NDC proposes the second deputy speaker, Alban Bagbin, as speaker. That's not all. There's a lot of names coming up. Jose Wusu remains the NPP's choice for the first deputy speaker. And this gentleman, Dominic Ayeni, is the NDC's choice for a second deputy speaker. Many say... He's a solid guy. Let's see how that pans out. Quality of leadership. And many have said that if the Eighth Parliament will survive, it will depend on the quality of the leadership. Remember, people have been uh, calling on the uh, Eighth Parliament because of how controversial it has become to build consensus. What kind of leadership are we going into the Eighth Parliament with? That will determine how business of the House will pan out. Now, the in the Seventh Parliament, you have... Professor Michael Kwe, who is the Speaker of Parliament, his Deputy Jose Owusu, Alban Bagbin, who is Second Deputy Speaker. Now, Oseche Mensa Bonsu, Majority Leader, Joa Safo is Deputy, Haruna Idrisu, Minority Leader, and you have James Klucha Veji as his Deputy. And then you talk about the Chief Whips, um, Honorable Kwesi Amea Ochreme, his Majority Chief Whip, Matthew Nyendam, First Deputy Chief Whip, Moses Enim, Second Deputy Whip. And Mohammed Mubarak Muntaka, Minority Chief Whip, Ibrahim Ahmed, his first deputy, Comfort Doyo Kujo. That name is very <laughs> interesting name. It rings a bell and it tells a certain story. But she's the deputy, uh, second deputy chief whip. Honorable Michael Kwe, and this is the eighth parliament. Michael Kwe is the choice of the NPP to retain the speakership. Jose Wusu, first deputy speaker. Oseche Mensa Bunsu, majority leader. Afenyo Markings is a deputy majority leader. That's what the NPP is proposing, and he will be taking over from Ajoa Safo if it happens tonight. Now, um, Frank Arnold Dompre comes in as majority chief whip, and then you have Seram Alahassan coming in uh, as deputy, second deputy, uh, first deputy whip, and then you have Habib Idrisu, MP for Tolong. He's a first timer, and he is going to be the second. Deputy whip for the NPP. You go to the NDC and you have Alban Bagbin proposed for speaker, Dominic Ayene proposed for second deputy speaker, Harun Idrisu for minority leader, James Klucha Veji as deputy minority leader, Mohammed Mubarak Muntaka, chief whip, Ibrahim Ahmed, first chief whip, uh, first deputy whip, and Comfort Doe, second. And it looks like the NDC is maintaining its team on the whip side. Let's look at the highs and lows of the uh, seventh Parliament. Oseche Mensa Bonso has been described as a strong leader representing a majority in Parliament. By his laws, he's been dismissive of colleagues from the other side. That's what people uh, describe him to be and has done little in incorporating minority views and building consensus. Le minority leader, 
has been described as someone who stood his grounds as minority leader to defend the minority group. But uh, many feel the chief whip Muntaka Mubarak took his shine. And uh, Alexander Kwame Nafenyo Marking, who comes in as the deputy majority leader, has been described as a young, articulate and energetic man. He brings on board some energy to the table, but many also describe him as too aggressive and has to tone down. Seriam al Hassan is coming in as second uh, chief whip for the NPP. She's been described as a resourceful character and one who, who will take the welfare of the members seriously. So she comes in as the deputy majority chief whip and her lows, she's been described as looking timid and is always quiet on the floor. Let's look at how the debates in the House will pan out because a lot of experienced hands are leaving and more than 120 MPs are coming in. Many say they are new to Parliament, but they have experience in governance. How will that uh, look like in the 8th Parliament? The minority's posture gives an indication it will be very aggressive and it will frustrate government. All of this is in one box called the 8th Parliament which will be inaugurated tonight at 12.01, after 12 midnight when the 7th Parliament has been resolved. My guests are already on board. Dr. Evans Agri Dako, his Chief Director of the Ministry of Parliamentary Affairs, Kenneth Drasser, his former Deputy Speaker of Parliament. Frank Davis is lawyer for the applicant in the Asin North uh, case. Abraham Amaleba is lawyer for the injuncted MP. And Martin Kwebu is private legal practitioner. I'll have them, I mean, I'll engage them after this break. Stay with me. Welcome back to PM Express, and uh, I want to start with you, uh, Martin Kwebu. Uh, we've been following how controversial who gets majority in parliament has become. This certainly will make a difference tonight. What does the injunction on the Asin North MP elect mean? Okay, so it simply means in the context of this case, the NDC's um, seat go down from 137 to 136. So the issue of the election of the speaker is one vote easier for the NPP. Well, it was never in doubt that uh, the NPP could easily win the vote for the speakership, considering or taking into account the promise made by Honorable Isiyama, that he was going to work closely with the NPP. So though we all knew that both parties had 137 each, Isiyama had promised that he would be with the NPP. So practically, the NPP were going to have 138 votes. So the injunction of the Asin North MP just reduces the NDC tally by one. Uh, let's see how it gets. I hope Mr. Amalba and the rest of the legal team will be able to pull out some miracles so that uh, they can get the injunction uh, stayed so that the member can take his seat. Um, talking about uh, the, uh, the injunction, uh, you know, filing for a stay of execution, uh, I've heard Amalba speak and he says that at the moment they tried to file for that uh, stay of execution, the clerk, the court clerk told him that he was in Salt Pond. He wasn't around. Already he said they had cited him around for morning, but immediately that process kick-started. The clerk was nowhere to be found. Um, how does this come across to you? Hmm. Very, it's quite uh, strange. Only if we, we can, uh, we will know for a fact that he was approached before 3 p.m. Because you see, ordinarily the filing counter is open up to 3 p.m. So this one will involve facts on the ground. 
you know, in matters like this, you and I were not there. Yeah. So <laughs> for me, the question would be that at what time were they trying to file? So we need objective evidence from the ground. If there's confirmation that it was not 3 p.m. yet, and number two, the clerk had not been given uh, any assignment. But in natural fact, if you, the clerk is given, filing clerk is given assignment to do something somewhere, usually there will be a substitute. So the critical thing we will need from the, uh, this in the court is to confirm that the time Mr. Amalba and the team were going to file, what time was it? If it was before 3 p.m., then that one, they had a legitimate expectation that somebody would serve them because it was working hours. So that's the key thing. I must say that we've been trying to reach uh, both lawyers, uh, Amaleba, who represents the injuncted MP, and Frank Davis, who is counsel for the uh, plaintiff. Uh, we're still trying to get them on Zoom so that they can contribute to this. But um, counsel, people com are comparing Asin North to Techiman South. Um, they say that in the Techiman South issue, the judge said uh, the people will be denied representation, so he couldn't grant the injunction. But in this case, the judge goes ahead to grant. What, what's your own appreciation, and especially the timing of this injunction? You see, the, uh, the thing is, Aisha, to be straight with you, this is one of those classical cases that you see, lay people would not accept because of the example you've given. But to be very honest with you, it's a decision the judge can defend, absolutely. You see, the thing is that, the key thing is that, so far, from what both sides have shown us in the media, once the judge is seeing the final certificate of renunciation of the Mr. Quason's uh, citizenship uh, from Canada, the certificate of renunciation, because it is dated 26 November, what I can understand is that for the judge, it's very clear that by 26 of November, or, uh, or before 26 November, Mr. Quasi had already filed his nomination. So that it means for the judge, at the time he was filing, he had not completed the process. He said, so the judge cannot be faulted for taking the position that at the time Mr. Quasin was filing, he hadn't finished. So there's a cardinal principle we use in law that a judge doesn't have authority to help somebody to breach an act of parliament or the constitution. Let's repeat, a judge doesn't have authority to help a citizen to breach an act of parliament or the constitution. So for him, the, the listen, Defining moment, at the defining moment, that is the date of the nomination, did Mr. Kwesi have the certificate? Once he didn't have, it means that for the judge, he was not uh, qualified to stand. That's it. But there's the other side. You know, as for emotions, we all have emotions. So I was talking pure law. For emotions, yes, yeah, certainly, oh, I have sympathies for Mr. Kwesi, that, oh, especially the part of the facts that show that he started last year, not even this year. So I'm like, ah, what at all in this universe conspired against him that he started something in 2019 and for a year it wasn't done. You he see, said so COVID emotionally, played a yes, part. I feel it for him. But unfortunately, this one uh, will have to deal with the law as it is. Let me bring in um, Ken Drassa, who is a former deputy speaker. Thankfully, he joins us via phone. Uh, Mr. Drassa, I'm grateful for your time. I want to gauge your mood on what has transpired in Asin North. Yes. Um, uh, my reaction uh, to your question is based on uh, the two subject areas that you just indicated. Asin North and um, Techiman North, Techiman South. Now, the truth of the matter is that uh, in the application of the law and its procedures, all adjudicating officials ought indeed to take a look at not only the letter of the law or the procedure, but the spirit behind it. 
what have we witnessed in relation to the detriments of, uh, you know, litigation? What the judge said, which in my opinion is right, is that it is wrong to deny somebody who has been declared, because that denial for him to sit in parliament would deprive uh, his constituents of their right to be, uh, to be represented. I think that that decision is based not only on the law, but the spirit behind uh, 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 the processes that go into determining whether uh, uh, inter interim injunctions would be uh, 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 applied or not. But when you come to the Astinov situation, now, the judge himself has virtually gone into the merits of the case. And he ought to, just like his counterpart in the Techiman North case, South case, he ought to have looked not only at the letter of the process, but also the spirit behind the grant or refusal of uh, the injunction. I, I think that uh, what happened in relation to the Astin North situation is a very big disappointment. I am totally surprised. And I, I do not know what I, I can equate this with. It, as uh, uh, Haruna Idrisu said, there is the general situation that we are confronted in this country where there is an application of two different laws depending on where your political colleagues, and that is not very healthy for our democracy. Interesting. Let me bring you in here, uh, Dr. Agridako, because all of this uh, will end up in Parliament tonight, and that will make a major decision um, in how the Speaker or leadership of the House is formed in the Eighth Parliament. So that brings to the conversation of leadership. Who are the people, who are the frontliners, who are leading the chart in Parliament? For the seventh parliament, and of course, in my slides, I spoke about how the majority leader, for instance, has been described as a very strong person in terms of um, standing on his feet for the majority in parliament, but also not somebody who was bringing along the minority or taking their suggestions into consideration. How for you has the leadership of parliament um, performed in the seventh parliament? Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity and good evening to your viewers. And uh, I think that uh, working closely with the seventh parliament, at least for close to three years, I've worked closely with them. And I've seen that the leadership in the house has performed creditably. Uh, at least uh, from the ministry's perspective, I've enjoyed a very good working relationship with them. So I'm, for instance, surprised that people are saying that um, the Minister for Parliamentary Affairs is not reconciliatory and is not building consensus. There has never been an engagement between the ministry and parliament, for instance, that he has not insisted that the minority side is adequately represented. As a matter of fact, any time we have a program and he comes in, the first question he will ask, is Haruna in? And if Haruna is not in, have you called him? Sometimes I'll say, oh, my people have called. I say, have you personally engaged him on the subject matter? Meaning that he has been reaching out. And if you look at what is it that they have been doing, and you check this whole concept of winnowing committee, that when bills have been referred to uh, the various committees and the bill is coming back to plenary, that they have, uh, he has, you know, a winnowing committee made up of himself and others like Yule Chire, you know, and, and others to literally sieve the bill, mm. you know, so that they are able to take care of some of the, you know, um, th those critical issues that can really catch their eye before they can get to parliament, for instance all in a bit to make sure that they speed out the process and also ensure some high level of quality assurance. Mm. Because if you have a committee that is superintending over uh, ensuring that indeed the critical issues are addressed after the committee you know, work, what it means is that you are not just interested in passing the laws, you are also interested in making sure that the laws that you pass will stand the test of time. Indeed, any serial society is governed by laws. 
And so if the laws are not properly crafted, you know the dire consequences that it will have for you and I in this state. And so they, they have built courses. I have engaged them, at least the core leadership, eight, no, 13 of them, mm. if you add the speaker and his two deputies, then the minorities and majorities, like, you are talking about 13 of them. Yeah. And they have been very responsive. From my perspective, we have engaged them on varied issues, issues that have to do with even the credibility of the institution, mm. even evaluating the performance of parliament itself and what performance of parliament itself means for democratic consolidation of this country. We have dealt with critical issues about the institution of parliament itself, issues of attrition, for mm. instance, yeah. and how the constant peeling off of the members of parliament potents danger for the institution itself. Because as you know, you know uh, what you call experience is not sold on the macular market. Yeah. And these are the dynamics that we have dealt with. Mm -hmm. We have dealt with very critical issues of monetization. Okay. And we have argued that if you're unable to deal with this democracy, potentially democracy derailing phenomenon of monetization, then it will get to a point where we we'll literally will sell you know, the, the vote to the highest bidder, mm. which will also have very dangerous consequences for the, for the state. We've dealt with them on a number of issues. For instance, when we even wanted to deal with uh, uh, um, even the, the, the vigilantism and related offenses, we engaged the core leadership on the subject matter. We've engaged them on even the quality of the committee work. Because trust me, any serious organization function through committees. Mm. In fact, it is not for nothing that someone like Woodrow Wilson, one of the presidents of the United States, mm. argue that when Congress is in the committee rooms, yeah. it's Congress at work. Yep. But Congress at plenary is Congress at public exhibition. Mm. So by extension, if I want to extrapolate, then I can say that Parliament in the committee rooms is a real Parliament at work. Okay. But Parliament in certain will be Parliament at public exhibition. Mm. What I'm inferring here is that if indeed we improve upon the quality of the committee work, it has a huge implication for the quality of work of parliament. Yeah. Because if you look at it critically, you are dealing with something in the neighborhood of 31 different committees, standing and select ad hoc. So we are looking at about 31 of them. Mm. So if they are functioning and they are firing on all cylinders, they have huge implication for the survival of Ghana's democracy. And, and, and majority leader has been extremely influential in all these arrangements and making sure that indeed all the, the key actors are brought on board. Opening up, making sure that we have constant engagement. Mm. We have even dealt with parliament from the ministries of parliamentary affairs perspective mm. on even strengthening the oversight function of parliament. Okay. Because don't forget that one of the critical functions of parliament is to make sure that they put the executive in check. Mm. Look, human beings are not angels on earth. And, and, and my mentor, Machiavelli, will tell you that the very day you and I become angels will not be fit for this earth. <laughs> because the earth is not for angels. That is why the executive will have to be you know, put on it toes mm. to ensure that indeed what they do, every step they take, every bill, legislative proposal they bring in there will have a huge implication by way of the qualitative improvement in a lifestyle. Mm. They have even, we have engaged them, and this one through my minister, we have engaged them and even dealing with, if you look at section 100 of the Public Procurement Act, okay. that deals with what we call a fiscal impact assessment. Mm. What it means is that every piece of legislation that comes to Parliament must be accompanied by fiscal impact assessment. Mm -hmm. Now, that assessment will help Parliament to appreciate the cost of implementing that piece of legislation. Mm. And it possibly even the revenue generating potential of that piece of legislation and possibly the employment generating potential of same. Mm -hmm. Now, we've dealt with all these things. We realize that over the years, we've not been doing that. And sometimes, that is why sometimes we pass a law and we are not able to implement. So my minister has actually, through the ministry, engaged parliament, we have engaged experts, and we have put these issues on the agenda. Okay. That making sure that parliament has the capacity. Because trust me, you cannot, do, you cannot give what you do not have. Yeah. You understand? You cannot you know, give what you do not have. That is why some people have argued that it's not enthusiasm that is used in growing cassava. Mm -hmm. You must know the know-how yeah. or have the know-how. Definitely. Then we have also dealt with even climate change policy mainstreaming. Okay. Through the minister, mm -hmm. we have engaged parliament, the various committees. We have even engaged 
you know, the committees on environment, we have engaged in constitutional, legal, and parliamentary affairs, we have engaged the finance committee, and several other committees on critical areas that in his considered opinion. Okay. So, so, so um, I, would, I, would, I would have to cut you, I would have to cut you there and, and, and take you to parliament uh, because something interesting, dramatic is happening because uh, we're told that the minority uh, in parliament, in the seventh parliament, has occupied the majority seats <laughs> in parliament. And it shows you clearly that at 12 midnight, it will be very interesting. Um, shortly, I'll be crossing over to my colleague Evans Mensa to tell us more on what the preparations are and what actually has um, inspired the minority to go and occupy the majority seats, despite the fact that there is an injunction barring one of its own to be part of uh, this uh, inauguration uh, ceremony. We'll be going to Parliament shortly, but on your screens is uh, how the chamber is looking like at this moment. The NDC um, minority is not looking perturbed at all, um, looking at their demeanor, their posture. It looks like they're all for it tonight. Maybe I should bring in uh, uh, Mr. Dresser. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Dresser, uh, let me let me again engage your mood because you've been in the first, second, third, fourth Parliament. Um, what do you make of what is happening right now in Parliament? Uh, I, I must be very honest to you. This is very very unprecedented, and it is a cause, a real cause for concern. Um. The, 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 the truth of the matter is that uh, the, the way the ratios are turning out now is likely to create a very volatile atmosphere within the house. Now, I have said on a different platform that what we have seen in pictures relating to the type of turmoil that we uh, saw in the Russian Duma parliament <laughs> and what has been happening, it even happened in Israel, the <laughs> Knesset. It even happened in many East African parliaments. What happened was that members of parliament converted seats and even their microphones into missiles. And the exchange literally fight. Mm -hmm. they, they turn the, the floor into a boxing arena. I beg, this should not happen. Definitely. You we see, don't it, need it, this it, at it this time. It is very grave. And I am not uh, behaving like a prophet of doom. But this, this is how these things start. And then the rollover effect is, uh, is to create a, a condition of ungovernability. Mm. And then at the end of the day, uh, we, 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 we start uh, falling on the pieces and start asking what has happened. Mm. I'll be gauging your mood as to uh, comparing your time in Parliament. At some point, you were first Deputy Speaker. Another time, you were second Deputy Speaker. As compared to the seventh Parliament, how it has performed, comparing it to your time in Parliament. But let me uh, allow Dr. Agri... Uh, I agree to conclude on the yeah. point you were making on the quality of leadership we're going to be, uh, yeah. we've had in the seventh yeah. Parliament. Yeah, so I just wanted to wish uh, Honorable uh, New Happy New Year. Uh, he became MP when I entered Legon. You remember, <laughs> so he was the first MP under the Fourth Republic in our know, West, West Wagon. Yeah. Uh, when I entered the first year, very interesting, yes. Mm. Yeah, so as I indicated, you, you also have had instances where even when leadership has even boycotted, I mean, minority leadership has boycotted parliament. They have attended our program. Mm. You understand? At the invitation of the majority leader. Mm. We've had a number of the boycotts. Yes, the you understand. So they have instances where they have said, oh, no, it's, it's parliament, we boycott, not your ministry. You, you understand? But it's also, you know, in political science, we call it anomic behavior, yeah. you know, demonstration and those things. Mm. But they are, they are democratic mm. anyway. There are ways by which you can also register your displeasure mm. about some development mm. and indicate to the people that indeed you are not happy mm. with some, some of the development. Okay. Mm. So these are the dynamics. And if you look at 
the Air Force leadership has, for instance, made in, in expanding the, the space for legislation. For instance, in, in July 5th, a major landmark development took place, paving the way for the introduction of private members' bill. Mm. And Honorable Ken will indicate that since 1993, not a single private members' bill had been introduced before this particular landmark development. Mm. You see, private members' bill, there are two types of bills, public bills and private members' bills. The public bills are usually the ones that will have them. Mm. The private members' bill can be sponsored, a bill that normally, when you go to UK, mm. is usually sponsored by backbenchers. Mm. We've had a number you of understand? them in this parliament. Yes, no, yes, yes, between July and now, mm. about seven are in the often. Mm. One has just been passed. Okay. You understand? And seven are, are there. No, so what we, and of course, they also have a guidelines that will help the introduction. For me, that is unique. Okay. You understand? Unique in the sense that, in fact, in the UK where this originated, only about 5% of all private member legislation get onto the legislation stage. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, they succeed in putting very vital issues on the public agenda, yeah. which eventually get activated by government. Okay. You know, so, for instance, my MP, Cynthia Morrison, you know, Agona West, may decide that a particular issue of importance must be put on the public agenda. Yeah. And once that is done, even if it doesn't succeed, you understand, if he doesn't, he doesn't succeed, our citizen in that area, because of course he is a minister, and therefore usually bills are sponsored by ministers. So the non-minister can actually do these things. What it does is that it opens the space for more participation. Mm. A lot more issues get onto the public agenda. Mm. And therefore, we put to rest the rigid, almost mechanical interpretation of Article 108, mm. which stipulated that the admissibility of a bill is usually determined by the speaker. Okay. And when in the considered opinion of the speaker, the bill has caused implications mm. to the state, he may say no. Okay. And Alajete, you know, uh, if my memory serves me right, serves me right, had indicated that even the paper on which a bill is written has caused implications, mm. and therefore he cannot admit, you know, okay. so on and so forth. That is very critical for me. And if you look at all those bills that have been passed, if you look at the number, for instance, the right to information, mm. yes, the activation met with the COVID, and therefore we couldn't rule it out properly. Yeah. But you see, if you are looking at democracy, democracy will go with certain critical ingredients. Mm. One of them will be information. Yeah. And I tell my students in Legon those days that you are as good as the quality of information that you have. Definitely. Information is a power resource. Mm. So people will consult you, not because you're a nice guy, but they'll consult you because you have information to deliver. Yeah. That is very critical. And so once people have information, then the issue of accountability checks and other things can be properly activated. So for, for, so for you, the seventh uh, uh, leadership of the seventh parliament has... has it has lived up to the belly. Have lived yeah, up to the There's been issues of the scandals, visa frauds, corruption scandals, and a number of... We've had walkouts, we've had... Um, boycotts and all of that. I'll come to that. Let me bring in uh, uh, Mr. Jurassa. And, and I was talking about the fact that you've been in the first, second, third, fourth parliament, and uh, we are in the seventh parliament. Uh, I just want to just oppose the two. Uh, the parliaments that you have served vis-a-vis -vis the seventh parliament. What's your own assessment of the seventh parliament? Good. Hello? Yes, Mr. Jurassa, you're on PM Express. Yes, if, if you have a little time, I will take you through parliamentary history. Okay, let, let's be a bit brief about it. A, a little bit of it. Time. Now, the first parliament, oh, uh, where I was uh, first deputy speaker, that was, okay, in 93. we started on a horrible note of disadvantage. Okay. <laughs> we didn't have accommodation. We didn't have offices. We were using the boots of our cars as, uh, you know, yeah. offices. We didn't have committee rooms, so the present corridors of the parliament, we were making uh, makeshift offices for, uh, you know, production. Okay. So that definitely, and the absence of uh, the uh, NPP from the house also created bottlenecks, which mm. we had to even have to fight uh, to extricate ourselves from the tag of uh, what they call a rubber stamp. Mm. Now, we moved into the second 
parliament. We had the same problems, no offices, nothing. And when you don't have the appropriate environment to operate, you definitely will not perform as would be expected. So the summary of what I'm saying is that gradually various parliaments have grown and they have improved in facilities and opportunities that are open to them. They have grown in uh, exposures and interactions with the international parliamentary uh, community. And these are all capacity-building processes that go to enhance the development of the institution mm. as parliament. Yep. So my remark in respect of the performance of the self parliament is that it is a reflection of what progress have we have cumulatively accomplished over the period. Mm. Don't forget that we have now the privilege uh, of hosting, that is the seventh parliament, hosting the longest serving uh, individual, yeah. Abam Bagbe, mm. who had been MP, if I'm not mistaken, let me see, 16 uh, plus 12. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 28 for, the whole, for the whole seven distance. So there has been, if it were in the industry, there would have been, we would say that there has been a transfer of technology. Mm. And uh, um, Honorable Majority Leader mm. is also an example of an excellent... 25. That has gone 24 through the... 24 years. So definitely, the seventh parliament eh, will mm. perf perform better than the, the sixth parliament. Mm. And let me pass a comment about the sixth parliament. Mm. I am going to pass a comment about the sixth parliament because of the impression... Mm. that the seventh parliament has passed so many bills. Mm. Let us not forget that President John Mahama spent nine months litigating his presidency yep. in court. Mm. That also affected production. Okay. So there are a number of factors and situations that govern parliamentary practice and sources. Mm. And if we want to go into all those things, we may not be able to complete today. But <laughs> by way of summary, I agree that the civil parliament has been an improvement mm. on uh, previous parliament. Okay. Whether it is quantitatively, as in the number of bills and the CID they are passed, or qualitatively, mm. as in the delivery of subject matters, mm. is another thing that we can contest uh, another day. You, For you, instance, mm. the Ejapa deal, yep. that is a huge blot, yep. a huge blot on the seventh parliament. And there are several others that we can cite, but by and large, uh, the spirit or uh, my, my attitude in this matter is to look forward to progress, progression in the development of the institution. It is for this reason that I am very much concerned about the developments that are unfolding in our recent political uh, environment. And uh, we, we should do something about it. And in that all of this, uh, Mr. Drasa, you've advocated for horse trading to drive the agenda of the House as we try to build consensus in the 8th Parliament. You've actually urged them to try and build consensus. How do you want this horse trading done as we have over um, 120 new members also joining the House? Yes, I, I, I had indicated on another platform just yesterday that having regard to the relative strength of both sides, at that time it was 137 and 137. It, is, it would be absolutely necessary to give and take, to engage in horse trading. And I cited the example of the need, for instance, for leadership to agree on who uh, that is, he, which party takes the, the, the Speaker of Parliament would allow the second uh, 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 partner, that is uh, uh, the second party in Parliament, to take the first Deputy Speaker. Hmm. And I have even recommended, it might sound ridiculous, but if we are to bridge rather than build a wall in between the two sides, we could easily offer the, te the second deputy speaker position to the independent individual. Mm. That way, they, everybody has taken a bite. But now, 
What is absolutely necessary is to determine who takes the first law. And that is where the bone of contention is. Mm. Now, I have also said that at that point in time, when uh, the, uh, we were not certain as to the number, uh, what could easily happen is to drop this whole idea of majority and minority and then adopt a different nomenclature. Mm. As, for instance, uh, describe the, the leader of government business as such, and then describe the other side as opposition. Now, there could be opposition in parliament, but that opposition could be in majority mm. because of our political dispensation and the structures we have. Okay. Assuming for the purposes of argument that in the next three, four months, the, uh, the, the contest in the various courts is near to the advantage of NDC. Mm. And the tables turn. Are we going to be now describing uh, Haruna Idrisu eh, as majority leader? So if we have a structure which, which doesn't place emphasis on uh, majority and minority, but focuses on who is the which is the government side there will always be a government side at any time and then there will be an opposition side mm. i picked this experience from the tanzanian parliament yeah i recall that we, i went for a seminar a capacity city building seminar to strengthen uh, the uh, committee system in the tanzanian parliament mm. there was a hot argument and i i carried the impression that by describing uh, uh, both sides as opposition and government side, it carries a better message. Mm -hmm. It carries a better in impression. Mm -hmm. So this is my little recommendation uh, to uh, the powers that be in the House there. If they need reconciliation in the circumstances, then I'm afraid they have to look at this as a, a very critical area. And it's quite interesting on your screen, you can see that the minority MPs have occupied the majority seats. They've removed names of the NPP MPs. And we're also told the injuncted MP, the Asin North MP, is in Parliament. And so interesting times ahead tonight. Um, let me bring you in here because um, we've been talking about building consensus and how the eighth parliament is going to look like. Uh, and uh, if the eighth parliament will survive or perform better, it all depends on the front liners, the leadership. And we are having people like Afenio Markings coming in as a uh, deputy majority leader. We are having people like uh, Dominica Yeni proposed for second deputy speaker. All of these, and, and, and in my presentation, I talked about Afenio Marking, who people say he's uh, an energetic person, he brings some energy to the uh, board, but they see him also as very aggressive and that he must tone down. That also uh, goes for Sarah Malassan, who is coming as first deputy uh, chief whip, and people say she looks quite timid in the house, she's always quiet, but she looks like a resourceful character, someone who will take the welfare of the people uh, into consideration. I mean, for you, what's your expectation of the Eighth Parliament, looking at all of these people who have been put up for leadership? Um, um, Aisha, you see, democracies, as advanced democracies, have gone through a certain process called a path dependency. And that is why they have been institutionalized. But for the fact that we have spent well over 23 years, you know, dealing with uh, military coups, etc., perhaps we would have had some precedent to deal with the current situation. You understand? So we've been able, we have been, I mean, truncating our political development thus far, and that is why we are seeing what we are seeing now. But these are processes that we will necessarily will go through. These are democratic, you know, issues that will come up anyway. Um, you are looking at the Eighth Parliament, the composition. You see, in, in, in political theory, I always tell my students that there are a number of things. Before you can change the rules, or before you can ensure that the rules are upheld, you need to be prepared to work with others. And, and Honorable Ken Jirasa will tell you what happened, for instance, in 2005. You see, when and I was, this is not for nothing that we call politics the art of the possible. 
Politics, that's one of the definitions of politics, the art of the possible. What it means is that if individuals or group of people are committed to a certain outcome and they commit themselves to it, they, are, they would necessarily craft a solution. So what we are having for me, mm. I, am, I, I see it as a necessary processes in our democratic development. Okay. And so we'll be able to craft something out of it, which will become a case study for others to come and look at. Mm. Um, the leadership, yes, if you look at the two major political parties in parliament, and surprisingly, you know, the, 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 the most popular MP was my graduate student. Okay. You know? So I taught him at a graduate school, wow. the formula MP. Mm. So uh, you see the two major political parties. They have all decided to, you know, re reorganize the leadership a little bit. Mm. Sometimes when changes do occur, or changes occur, you need to change to deal with the emerging the exigencies of the times. Okay. Um, they may, Sarah may be very quiet, mm. but trust me, she leads the most, I mean, I would not say enlightened, but the most educated you know, constituency. Mm. If you look at the lawyers, you know, for somebody to hold that seat, mm. It's not, it can't say it's a pushover okay. at all. Yeah. Because you are, and those people will not vote. I mean, there's a constituency that I have lived in since 1992 until okay. recently. Mm. They won't vote because, you know, you don't want to vote. You, they want to listen to you. Yeah. So it's a very tough custom. Mm. And if you remember, the polka parties, NDC and MPP, they will really look at the background of those specific individuals mm -hmm. before such individuals are put in mm. some, those positions. Mm. But critically, it will call for a lot of, you know, consensus building. Okay. But it's something that the Ministry of Parliamentary Affairs has been talking about. Okay. It was actually, the ministry was actually put there to build consensus among the critical actors within parliament and then within the state. Mm. Why? Because we think that ideas matter. Yep. You remember in 2008, Obama said to Hillary when he was saying that these are ideas you can zero us. Obama's conclusion was that ideas matter. Ideas Nations matter. are developed because of ideas. Yeah. And so they think that when we have an enterprising group, mm. divergent perspectives, mm. you listen to different shades of opinion. Mm. And that is why JS, you know, JS Mill will tell you that if you are not prepared to listen to other people's opinion, mm. you cannot shape your own opinion. And talking about ideas and the issue of attrition yes. has, has come out strongly. Yes. The fact that a number of the experienced hands are moving mm. out. And you talked earlier about the fact that um, experience is not uh, something you can just go to the market yeah. and pick. You build yeah. it over time. And the fact that there, ha there are more than 120 people coming in as inexperienced who are coming in as yeah. first hand. But again, Again, people like uh, Amin Adams, people like John Kuma, are people coming in with governance experience because they've served in various, um, you know, capacities yeah. in governance. How do you expect the debates to pan out in the Eighth Parliament? Yes, we. It's important, my, my sister Aisha. You. It's important to appreciate that in, uh, apprenticeship everywhere is important. Apprenticeship, whichever institution. <laughs> Interesting. I'm told that, uh, I mean, before before this time, Katie Hammond, uh, everybody was looking everywhere Katie for Hammond, Katie Hammond, Hammond and <laughs> we're told his phones were even off, but now you can see him in the chamber and you know, he's always been dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to uh, speak to his colleagues on the minority side yes, to get up from the majority side and make way for the majority. And so he, you can see on your screens that he's just going around and <laughs> doing what he's best known for. <laughs> Okay, right. so, so Katie Amon, now finally we found where Katie Amon is because a lot of people were worried. Yes. So, okay. Yeah, so on the attrition, Mm. It has been a major issue. Okay. I mean, I know in the media, in the media, you know, uh, multimedia, yep. I'm sure that you put a lot of premium on experience. Definitely. You, there are some responsibilities that you will not assign to a first timer. Definitely. Because he, the person will undermine the integrity of the organization. Definitely. No matter how enthusiastic the person it is. It is. So apprenticeship is almost always important. And the same thing applies to parliament. Mm. I mean, when you go to the universities, you can't just assign somebody to 
you know, to supervise a PAD because the person is a doctor. Mm. He may, the person may be producing dangerous characters for this country. Mm. Dangerous, you understand? And no, if you have, you know, have base callers, it's danger for the society. Yeah. That is why even the government in its considered opinion has indicated that even retired lecturers must stay on up to about 70, depending mm. on your grade 65, 70, etc. Mm. Now, the attrition rate in our parliament is worrying. Mm. And it is not, this is an issue that leadership of parliament you know, has discussed with, with our ministry, or for instance. Okay. And we, one of the things that we engage our attention was to look at this attrition. Okay. The peeling off of experienced ones is worrying. Um, it's almost about 50% will hover around that area. Nigeria has something close to 70. You know, when we go to South Africa, around 60. Benin is about 50.5. Mm. In fact, when you go to the US, the attrition rate is 10.5, something below 12%. What it means is that if we send 100, you know, House of Representative guy to the polls, mm. it's likely that 90 of them will return. Mm. It is not for nothing that Nancy Pelosi, for instance, has been in Congress mm -hmm. for 33 solid years. Mm -hmm. You understand? And there were others who were there for 40 years among others. Of course, the dynamics are different. We'll talk about that. Yeah. But the constant peeling off of the members is dangerous. Mm. And Ken Wu, uh, Honorable Ken Jirasan, will attest to that. Mm. Experienced guys, hands. We've lost uh, a Sibiya Boa, for instance. Mm -hmm. we've we've solid guy. Solid for the guy. And, 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 and for the finance committee, I'm yes. told it's made of 25 people. Yes. We've lost about 15 of, of the people yes. on it. So, and, and in the last few yes. days, they were looking for people precisely. actually precisely. to make up that precisely. committee. Precisely. precisely. And people were even looking at the possibility that yeah. uh, I knew, for instance, that there were discussions to the even effect that if Professor Jan Bafo retained his seat, then it was likely that they were going to bring him out of the executive to come and chair the finance. The finance and then, committee. And then, it didn't so, happen. And because in, in parliament, the danger is that your employers are not in Accra. They are in the <laughs> constituency. And so you can be doing whatever you want to do here. Yeah. The employers there will decide. Yeah. And then of course, if you look at Ahmed Banda, I mean, if yeah. you look at Ibrahim, the, the, Ibrahim. Ibrahim Banda, look at the one who was chairing the constituency. Uh, ben, 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 ben Abdallah. Banda, ben yes. Abdallah Banda. Yes who are chairing the, the, the Constitutional Legal, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs, Affairs Committee. Committee yeah. That we've also lost him. Mm. We've lost the Electra, for instance. Electra. You don't understand? We've lost, you know, Inu Safusini. He decided out of he his, all his own volition yeah. not to come back. Mm. So what it means is that it, because it's also a highly procedural institution, mm. you need people who are not just enthusiastic, yep. but people who are also willing to be mentored. Mm -hmm. You see, I always say that mentorship... It's a two-way traffic. The mentee must agree to be mentored. Okay. You understand? And sometimes the mentor himself must have the capacity to mentor. Definitely. But if all of them are learners, then who mentors who? Becomes you understand? It becomes a difficult and a problem. So where, as we move on, we will find innovative ways of not just ring fencing or protecting some people. But when we build capacity up to a certain level, maybe we'll stabilize mm. and then we'll have members who will stay and then they themselves will then will bequeath to mm. others mm. before they exit. Okay. You understand? We're all trained, mm. you understand, by some professors. Yep. And as they were exiting, they knew that we had the capacity to step in their shoes. That is how institutions develop and institutions grow. Mm. But of course, as I said, the number of things that we will talk about, the issues of monetization, Political parties themselves not having any serious uh, framework for assessing their MPs, mm. both in the House and in the constituency. Mm. Nobody has it. NDC, MPP, they don't have serious framework to assess them, their, their MPs. And it's something that we are discussing with leadership of parliament, for instance, that mm. the, lead, and the political parties must actually you know, come to the table and deal with some of these issues so that they can uh, deal with the quality, not just the numbers. Mm. So as, as you indicated, yes, people are coming in with some experience, yep. which is critical. Mm. I have always argued that lawmaking is not lawyering. Yep. It's not just about lawyering. Mm. You need psychologists, you need political scientists, you need linguists, yep. you need sociologists, mm. because the laws we make has all kinds of implications Definitely. for society. Mm -hmm. And the laws have several ramifications. And, technicalities. and all these technicalities, all these expertise must be brought to bear in shaping a particular piece of legislation so that it will address the critical problems that confront the society. Mm -hmm. You understand? But at the same time, as I said, these people with these backgrounds will come in and will hope that they'll be humble enough to learn the rules quickly mm -hmm. because the rules of procedure, the rules of the game, in fact, for parliament, 
the rules are very stringent. Mm. And you need to master the standing orders and know your constitution and read thoroughly some of the, the hazards among others mm. and deal with all kinds of... It's not about newspaper publications or hearsay or you just... It's the, you people are arguing in the street and it becomes the basis of your argument. Mm. It is the more reason why we're asking that parliament work closely with the statistical services for mm. instance so that the data that the statistical service produces will be usable mm. and then that can also inform policy debate. I would have others. to end PM Express here, but um, after this, uh, you get the opportunity to conclude on the point you were making about leadership and the attrition rate. Yes. And also, uh, Martin Pebu is still on the line. He's a private legal practitioner. You also get to tell me your expectation. I'm sure you're watching the interest in the drama that is ensuing in Parliament. You'll be telling me your expectation of what the Eighth Parliament should look like and what you'll be looking for um, at 12 midnight, when the 7th Parliament will be, is uh, being dissolved, um, Kenneth Jirasa is his former second deputy uh, speaker. Thank you so much for your time. I'm grateful that you were able to join us. That's how we wrap up for PM Express. We are back on our election headquarters. You need to stay here throughout the night because it's the decision night. And then very soon, I'll be handing over to my colleague Evans Mensa and uh, Winston Amua, who are stationed in Parliament. They will be bringing us all the sights and sound from there. Stay with me.